So today, I'll, I'll finish talking about bumper cars and go on and talk a bit about, about spring scales. They're both fairly simple stories once you know the sort of the physics that underlies them, which I guess makes them complicated stories. But, but I've got three things to deal with with uh, bumper cars, and I've, I've done some of it, and I'll, I'll just flesh out the things that I left behind or did too fast last time. Bumper cars, when they're, when they're hitting each other, are transferring conserved quantities. I mean, that's a way of thinking about all their interactions, and it really explains a lot of the motion uh, between the bumper cars. If bumper cars don't do it for you, then any of the, the, the sports like billiards and snooker and stuff where the, where the balls are hitting each other, it's the same physics, things, things hitting and passing along conserved quantities. One of the conserved quantities is energy, but, and we, we watch that move around, we know it's conserved, and I'll come back and play with it uh, later. But, but momentum and, and angular momentum are, are very important to bumper cars because we care about things moving. And energy is not about moving, it's about being able to do things. Momentum is about going somewhere, it's about moving. Momentum has a direction to it, so it's a, it's a vector quantity, and do remember that. For energy has no direction, momentum does, and they're not interchangeable. They're really apples and oranges, so you can't turn momentum into energy or vice versa any more than you can turn money into time. They're just different things. Um, and the other quantity I'll come back to and talk about is angular momentum. So I showed you, I tried to illustrate the fact that momentum is a conserved quantity, that, that when you get it, you carry it with you. With you. Um, one of the things that I didn't do with a Pasco, that, that cart that I was standing on, and I would, I would get some rightward momentum and carry it with me across the room, and then I would give it to the wall. Uh, that's, when I use the word rightward in there, that's very important because the direction of the momentum is, is critical. Rightward momentum is, is it's, it's in the same quantity, it, it's the same physical quantity as leftward momentum, but they're not equal. You know, 10 units of, of rightward momentum and 10 units of leftward momentum are very different because the direction matters. In fact, in, uh, in fact, and I mentioned this in the lecture video, in, in general, vector quantities, like a vector to the right was what I was doing in the video. So this is one, we're thinking in terms of feet maybe. This is one uh, vector step to the right. This is, two, this is a step of, of two to the right, three to the right. What if you go down three, two, one, zero to the right, negative one to the right? So a vector quantity pointing to the left and one unit long is the same as minus that vector quantity, minus one of the, uh, long to the right. I mean, I, 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 I flipped who's, who's negative. This quantity over here, that is, you can, it, it, you can describe it as one foot pointing to the left or negative one foot pointing to the right, a deficit of rightward. We're okay with that? You know, so, okay, so why do that? Why? Because when I run up to the wall and give it all my momentum, I've got 10 units to the right, I gave it all my momentum. Now I've got zero. I can actually give it more than 10 to the right. Watch me do that. I'm going to give it 20 to the right. Here we go. I'm going extra fast. 20 to the right. I, I really did. I gave it 20 units to the right, more than I had. I'm now running a deficit of rightward momentum, which is you know, a negative amount of rightward momentum, 10 units, which is leftward momentum. And you know, okay, so that seems crazy. Why would you ever do that? Well, things bounce a lot. Like if I throw a ball, I got a ball or a bean bag. If I throw a bean bag at the wall, bean bags don't bounce. So I, so I pack it full of 10 units of momentum to the right, whoosh, hits the wall, smack, and drops. It transferred 10 units of momentum to the right. Can, you, can, you, can I transfer more than 10 units? Sure, get a bouncy ball. I throw this, a bouncy ball, same mass, I throw it at the same speed, so it's carrying the same momentum, 10 units to the right, and it, boing, it bounces back at me. In that bounce, it will have transferred not 10 units to the right, but maybe almost 20 units to the right. And so why would you care about this? 
you go to the, the county fair or the state fair, there are these games of, of, of skill or chance or whatever, they, I don't know what they call them, where you're trying to win the great big huge stuffed animal that falls apart the second day you own it because it, you know, it, it, I can go on forever about those games. Most of the games are rigged against you by, by physics. And one of them is trying to knock over the milk jugs or something like that. And how do you knock them over? Well, give them a big dose of momentum so they start to move. How do you give them the biggest dose? Don't use a bean bag, because the bean bag hits and stops. You can actually give it more momentum by using a bouncy ball. It hits and, and kicks back. And in the kick back, there's another push, another transfer of momentum, and it knocks over the object better. Is that okay? And this happens in, in, in bumper cars. They do not put sand bumpers around the car. If it was sand that was around the car, um, you could still have, the bumps would still be gentle enough that you wouldn't bite your tongue off. But there'd be no rebound. And the transfers of momentum wouldn't be as good. Uh, it, it wouldn't be the same, the same adventure. You, you, things wouldn't, the transfers would be smaller because there'd be no kickback. All right? What else do I want to talk about with this? So, so momentum is a conserved quantity. It moves around among the cars and bumper cars or whatever the sports you want to have going on here, I mean, all the billiard sports and stuff like that. Um, there are many others that it does. You, you kick the ball, you hit the ball with a racket or whatever. You're, you're transferring momentum back and forth, and that's part of what, what controls how the games work. About the transfers, the transfer of momentum I told you last time, and I'll just re reiterate that, and I won't ever ask you to, 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 to do this on a test. The momentum that I carry, like everything else, is my mass times my, my velocity. So momentum is in the direction of velocity, they're the same. Um, so that's, that's the quantity of momentum you carry. How about the transfer process? And here's another uh, observation that I won't directly expect you to remember. Um, the, the means of, the mechanism for transferring momentum. We saw the, the mechanism for transferring energy, it's called work, right? And that one I care that you remember. You do work how? You push on something and it moves a distance in the direction of your push. So, can I do work on the wall? I mean, for all practical purposes, can I do work on the wall? No. Why not? I can't make it move. So I can go over there and I can smack away at the wall. I can't give it energy because it won't move. I mean, you know, a teeny tiny bit, yeah, but, but for all practical purposes, no. It's very hard to give immo immovable objects energy. And that's part of the rigging of, of uh, the, the, these uh, fair games against you. Uh, there are a lot of ones that involve immovable objects and you trying to get the ring, the plastic, bouncy ring to stay on top of a glass bottle, which won't move and you can't give it any energy. Or, or the basket on the wall, you try to put the basketball in it without it and come to a stop, but you can't give the basket any energy because it's stiff. Anyway, you can't, it's hard to give energy to things that won't move. It's easy to give momentum to them. The mechanism for transferring momentum, it's called an impulse. It's a force times a time. So the momentum I give to, to the wall, yeah, always the wall, is the force I exert on the wall times how long I push for. And if, if I vary my force, it gets complicated. But, but if I give it a uniform force for three seconds, I transfer a well-defined amount of, of momentum to it, which is my force. That is, I don't know, 10 pounds of force to the right times three seconds. 10 pounds times three seconds is 30 pound seconds, which is actually a unit of, of momentum. It's an American unit. It's terrible. But it doesn't matter. But, but you can see that's how you transfer momentum. And I can transfer momentum to the wall, no problem, because it doesn't, it doesn't have to move. I just have to be able to push on it, and time has to be able to pass, which is easy. All right? So that's, that's the transfer of momentum. That said, I can acquire a certain amount of momentum and then give it to the wall and I can make those two transfers somewhat different. For example, I can obtain my 10 units of rightward momentum very slowly with a small force, 
I've got more, I've got more, I've got more. I'm up to 10 units to the right. And now I'm going to give it, bang, the wall very fast. Those are different transfers. I did get 10 units of momentum to the right over a long period of time. And then I transferred 10 units of momentum to the right to the wall over a short time. Same impulse, but the forces and time were different. It's the product that matters. Is that OK? That said, let me ask you guys, I'll you know, ask you a question here. Ah, I've gotten tired of lecturing in what I consider to be the dark. So I turned up the lights. There you can see the question. OK, so suppose I've got two different mallets. And these are actually different baseballs. Um, two different, ba ba one, one softer than the other. They have the same mass. I'm going to swing them equally fast. They're both going to stop completely on a nail. And the issue is, compared to the harder one of these mallets, the momentum transferred by the softer mallet. So we're looking at the momentum transferred by the softer mallet. How, how, what's different about it and about the transfer? You OK with the question? Of course, I forgot to start this program. Where is this thing? And now, wait, da 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 Come on. There it is. I apologize for not planning ahead. Register, get me out of here. OK. Oh, I love software. My favorite. OK. You're actually now able to, to, to vote. Okay, I'll give, give you another 10 seconds and let, let, let's, let's see what you think. Five, four, three, two, one. So the majority are going for B, that the momentum transfer is the same, but the force involved is smaller with the soft mallet. There's a substantial number of you who are going for that the momentum is less, but the force is the same. And so let's look first at C, which is, it will turn out to be the wrong answer, I'm afraid. With, with, with C, if I get these two mallets going at the same downward velocity, and they have the same mass, they have the same momentum with them. We, we haven't even, you can't, at this point, you don't even know which one's the softer one. Is that OK so far? When they come to a complete stop on the nail, which is part of the, the story this time, they give, have given up all their momentum. So the amount that they transfer the nail has to be the same. They acquired the same momentum, didn't have anything to do with their softness. It's their mass times their velocity. And they gave it all up. It's got to be the same transfer momentum. We're OK with that? The issue is how fast they transfer the momentum and how hard they push. And the softer mallet because it's softer, it takes longer to do the transfer. As it starts to push on the nail, it begins to dent, and it needs the, the, the ball to, to move farther before it can push a little harder, and then it needs the ball to move more. The, ball, the, the ball's impact uh, occurs over a long period of time, spread out by the fact that everything's, uh, everything's denting, and there's, there's time involved in that denting process for the soft ball. The hard ball, however, um, reaches enormous force without denting very much. That's what makes it hard. 
And so it transfers the momentum much faster with a big force for a short time. So the, the soft mallet, and I come back out of here, the, the soft one transfers all its momentum with a small force for a big time, whereas the hard mallet transfers its force, transfers its momentum with a big force for a short time. You okay with the physics of it? So I can show you, and you guys can, can you see here, I'll ag over here and do it. And then I can, I've had people do this, you, you know what's gonna happen. So here's, here's, the, here's, the saw, here's the hard one. This is the official league Wilson ball. You know, it's, it's pretty much a hammer. So those of you who have played with one of these things, when it hits something, like you, it transfers all its momentum in the, in the blink of an eye by way of a huge force. So this is a dangerous object thrown at you. It hurts, this is the reason why you know, someday if you become parents, be careful putting these in the hands of little kids. Um, I, used, I used to have a, I still probably do have a picture of a, of a friend who was, the, the, two ch the two kids, he was, he was actually a, a pitcher for VMI for a while, and he threw the ball at his little brother and got him right in the eye, and, and Ben had, had uh, incredible, you, know, you, you can sort of picture like, is he ever gonna see again? Um, he, he's fine, but it was like really nasty. So that's the hard ball. Here's the soft ball. You can't pound in the nail. In fact, you can do it to your hand. Don't do that with that league ball. It transfers all its momentum over a long period of time with a small force. It's okay? And this, phys this, so this is the physics of a, of a hammer. How does a hammer drive a nail in? It's very hard, right? So you, you invest the downward momentum or the momentum in whichever direction you're trying to nail. You invest it gradually, it accumulates, and then it transfers its momentum into the nail because it's, they're all hard surfaces. It transfers that momentum just like that. Huge force, tiny time. And it pushes the nail right into, the, into things. So that's the world of hammers, but you encounter this stuff everywhere. In fact, I sort of can quip about, we go through life trying to transfer momentum as slowly as possible. What does that mean? When, you, when you, it's late at night, you're trying to go find a refrigerator, and you bump into something and come to a stop, you care what you bump into. If it's a hard thing like the cement wall, it's gonna hurt, because you're gonna lose all your momentum in a jiffy, and by way of a huge force. On the other hand, if you walk into somebody's beanbag chair or the sofa or something soft, you transfer the momentum more gradually. It's why we put, you're a pole vaulter, what do you wanna land on? Asphalt or a big pad that takes your momentum out slowly? So that's one of these no duh moments. Uh, a car, you're driving along in a car, you go off the road and you hit a tree, and here, here again, if, you know, if, I'm, if I'm bringing up something that's painful, I apologize, but you hit the tree, how do you want to stop? Because you, you're, you're carrying momentum yourself personally. You gotta come to a stop with a car. This car is stopped by the tree, you gotta stop also. How are you gonna do it? Do you want to hit the, the steering wheel and transfer all your momentum very fast, or do you want to hit an airbag and transfer it much slower? That's, what the, that's the whole point of the airbag. It's, it's to take the momentum out of you slowly. Okay? So it's a public service announcement type stuff. You, you know, look to soft things and what you want to hit. It's always the slow, slow transfers. All right? That's the world of momentum. Do I have anything else to talk about with momentum? Okay, angular momentum. So I, I started talking about angular momentum. Again, it's a conserved quantity. Once you've got it, you can't, you can't change it without transferring it to somebody else. You, I mean, you can't have it in the first place without transferring it in. And so the, the simple way of, of illustrating that is just with me, I'm gonna get on a swivel chair. That's a, it's a pretty good swivel chair, not perfect. But the point is, and I'm here, I'm, I'm turning for no reason because of, you know, there's a little bit of trouble. But the idea is that in principle, I cannot start spinning until something transfers angular momentum to me. And the something is gonna be the floor. And I'm gonna get it by way of an angular impulse, which is a torque for time, a twist. Something's gotta twist me for a period of time. And that will convey angular momentum to me in the direction of the torque. So I'm gonna have the floor twist me 
again, right hand rule stuff. I'm gonna have it twist me in an upward direction. And I'll have, there, I've got upward angular momentum. And I can't get rid of the stuff. I'm, it's stuck. I'm stuck with it until I give it away. And I'm gonna give it away to the floor by getting it to give me a downward torque for time. Okay, and I got rid of it. And of course, you're still moving, but that's my problem. All right, so it, it came into me, I, I carried it with me for a while, and then I gave it away. It's, it's, it's the rotational equivalent of me flying across the room, having gotten rightward momentum from that wall and giving it to that wall. All right? Um, the fun and games, which I tried to do last time, and I'll do it properly this time. The fun and games, this is always treacherous. <laughs> I, I don't really want to experience that. So I'm going to get this, this, this wheel I know works well. It's, it's older than I am, probably. And it's still going. OK, so I'm, so I'm getting it spinning. And I want to talk this one through a little more carefully. That swivel chair um, only, al only allows for, for angular momentum to stay unchanged when that angular momentum is vertical. Any horizontal parts of the angular momentum are just are chewed up by, by the fact that it's not a universal swivel chair. It's not like one of those, those gym things where you can swivel in any direction. So right now, we've got no vertical angular momentum, zero. This thing's spinning purely about a horizontal axis, so it's got no angular momentum. And I'm not spinning at all, so I've got zero angular momentum. But if I turn this now so that it has upward angular momentum, which it does, that direction, I have downward angular momentum. We started with zero. We, we still have zero. There's, now it's zero uh, where neither of us have any, uh, any vertical angular momentum. Now I'll go this way. It's now got downward, I've got upward. Zero, I, it's got upward, I've got downward. It's just zero each time. But it's I'm just redistributing it. Is that okay? And you might think, well, how is it going between, how is the angular momentum being transferred? It's transferred by a torque, right? Torque for time. Well, this thing's twisting me hard. Every time I flip it, it fights me. It twists me. Ah, I mean, I can feel it. So, so this is why I would encourage you to try this, because you, you feel the effect. Of course, you have to have not super short arms. Otherwise, you end up with tracks, right? You OK with what I was just doing there, or questions about it? Wasting energy. I, there was energy put into it, right? So I got to get rid of the energy. I did it by skidding. Um, I did want to answer this one. Um, question came up about the elevator situation. If, 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 I, if I'm a statue riding an elevator and the elevator's going up, am I doing work on the spring? The answer is yes. Because the work story, the question asks, well, aren't the forces all canceling out and stuff? And they, they are. In fact, the net force on the spring, when we're going up, well, at the moment, we're motionless. But if I were actually, you know, OK, during that time, the, the net force on the, on the spring was still zero. Wasn't accelerating. Net force zero. That doesn't say anything about whether I'm doing work on it or not. Whether I'm doing work on it or not depends on, am I pushing on the spring? Don't worry about the Earth and gravity. Irrelevant. Am I pushing on the spring? Yes. Is the spring moving a distance in the direction of my force on the spring? Yes. You know, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm moving, shh. So I'm doing work on it, absolutely. The fact that it's got other things pushing and pulling on it, it's irrelevant. Is that okay? The same thing with right now. So that's the world of work and why this is relevant to what I'm talking about right now with, with momentum and angular momentum is right now, gravity, is gravity transferring momentum to me? The Earth's gravity. The answer is yes. Why? Because gravity is pulling down on me with the force. You know that it's got a name. It's called my weight. Right? So the Earth is pulling down on me. And time is passing. <gasps> the Earth is doing an impulse on me. In fact, every second it does more on me. It's putting downward momentum into me all the time. So why am I not moving faster and faster downward? It's because there's a second thing pushing on me, the floor. It's pushing me upward with a force all the time. And that's giving me upward momentum all the time. Second, and they cancel. I accumulate no momentum. 
The other way to look at it is gravity puts momentum into me. I realize this is like off the wall philosophical practically. Gravity's putting momentum into me in the downward direction, and I'm simply passing that momentum to the floor. I'm pushing the floor down just as hard for the same seconds. I don't accumulate any. And you know, why would, you know, what does that matter? Well, suppose that the floor stopped taking away my momentum. If I lost the ability to transfer my momentum to the floor, like you got rid of the floor all of a sudden, gone, I would fall. And what's falling? Well, a way to look at falling is I accumulate more and more downward momentum. Earth's giving it to me. I start to accumulate it because I can't get rid of it. I start moving faster and faster in the downward direction. That's falling. It's just another way of looking at exactly the same thing as we did day two or something. Is that okay? So um, you can have many momentum transfers going on at once, and if they sum to zero, you don't accumulate any momentum. Um, another way of looking at airplane flight, which we will do in the not too distant future. The airplane, like air, and you in the airplane, you're being given downward momentum all the time by the Earth. So why don't you fall? It's because the airplane's job is to give away that momentum to the passing air. That's, that's what flying is about. You give away the momentum to the passing air. The air then goes downward, having been given this nifty dose of downward momentum. And the air leaving the, that an airplane leaves behind is indeed heading downward on average. Um, but that's, you know, that's what keeps the airplane aloft, is giving away the momentum. The technique, we'll see, is, you know, it's got to do with all kinds of airflow stuff, and it's, but it'll, it works. All right? So momentum, angular momentum. A few more things about angular momentum, and I could play questions with If both mallets have the same mass and same acceleration, how can their forces be different, as in F equals ma? Their accelerations are not the same. They have the same mass. And when they come to a, when these two mallets thump, when they, when they land like that, the hard one experiences a huge force from the table, and it accelerates upward very fast. So the acceleration is huge, the force is huge, the mass is the mass. This guy accelerates much more slowly. The acceleration is smaller, the force is smaller. So both sides of the F equals MA equation, if you like to think that way, they're smaller in proportion. All right? So, so it all works out. One of, the, one, of the, one of the nice things, I guess, about the physics is it's self-consistent. You can think about the same situation and problem five different ways, and they'll all come out with the same answer. And if you really sort of dig under the hood and figure out what's going on in the, in the five different ways, they're not really different. They're just, they're technically different on the surface, but they all have the un same underlying physics. Is the earth or the floor doing work on you all the time? And the answer is no. How much work is, I mean, the, the earth, the earth's gravity is pouring downward momentum into me because it's exerting a downward force on me for time. The floor, on the other hand, is pouring upward momentum into me because it's exerting an upward force on me for time. They, they sum to nothing, and I end up getting nothing. The question then this asks is, what about work? Is gravity doing work on me all the time and the floor doing work on me? No, because there's no movement here. Work has, it's harder to do work, than it, I guess, than it is to do <laughs> transfer momentum. It's hard to work. Um, story of our times, or life. Anyway. The gravity is doing no work on me because I'm not moving. Yeah, it's pulling me down, but I'm not moving. No work. The floor is pushing me up, but I'm not moving. It does no work on me. All right. Okay, so I have a few more things to do with, with angular momentum. Yeah, I guess this with momentum, you can't change your mass. I mean, apart from, yeah, Alex? Oh, what was the right answer? It is B. The, the, impact, the impact transfers the same momentum. It just spreads it out in time and therefore has a small force. That's what soft balls do. Yeah? They're swung equally fast, which means that you are bringing them up to speed at the same rate. So 
up until the moment of impact, they're indistinguishable. They both accumulate momentum at the same rate, which is relatively slowly. You know, you've got a half, I don't know, it's not a half a second, it's a quarter of a second during the swing. So it's a modest force exerted up for a quarter, whole quarter of a second, and they accumulate that much momentum downward. It's when they hit that they become noticeably different. The hard one, because it can't dent very far, has to get rid of all its momentum and come to a stop quickly. So it uses a short time, big force. The other one, because it can dent, can transfer at leisure. It's a small force, long time. Is that okay? So that's all the hammers operate on this principle. Take, take your time investing the momentum, but suck it out quickly when, during the impact. They're called impact forces, actually. So just, just for a generic name, things, when they hit, they transfer momentum. And the, the harder they are, the harder the surfaces are, the, the, the faster that momentum transfers and the bigger the, the impact forces are. Uh, often, gravity's irrelevant. I mean, yeah, gravity's around, there are weight forces, but, but would you, you know, this is, this is much nicer to be hit with than that. And it's the same going up. There's just as, this is me trying to wave my hands and say, who cares about gravity? You, you can hit, you, you just, it, it's just as unpleasant being hit, and hit up with this ball as hit down. Yeah, one's got gravity helping, one's got gravity hindering, but it's so, it's insignificant, who cares? Most of the force involved in getting hit with this has nothing to do with gravity. It's the sheer transfer of momentum that's involved and how fast it goes. Yeah, Dave? Yeah, when a, when a bouncy ball hits the wall and transfers more, more momentum than it had, if you compare that bouncy ball to a ball that's, that doesn't bounce, which they exist, a beanbag is too different to compare, but two balls, one of which bounces well, one of which doesn't bounce well, they, they, they start the story the same. They both hit and come to a stop. The, the bounceless ball ends the story at that point and just drops to the floor. The, the one that bounces continues. It bounces back, an act which involves pushing off, which takes time and involves a momentum transfer. So the bounce is longer than the non-bounce. It's, it's got a second half. It's got a, 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 a sequel during the rebound. Yeah, proud? The momentum that the bounceless ball, uh, what happens to the momentum transfer, it's, if, if I'll just illustrate them both myself. When I go over here and I hit, so far you can't tell whether I'm a bouncy ball or, or a non-bouncy ball. I've given all my momentum to the wall over a moderate amount of time with a fairly gentle force because I don't feel like hurting myself, right? The bounceless ball simply now stops pushing on the wall and falls. So the, the story ends at that point. No further transfer of momentum. The ball ends up with, what, with zero, and, and it's part from what the gravity gives it eventually as it falls. But the bouncy ball continues to push, and it, there's a, it's actively pushing off the wall when it does this. So it's giving the wall still more momentum that way and the wall, in turn, gives it momentum the other way. Is that okay? So things like, like a battering ram, another example. If you want to knock down a door, okay, you know, knock down. Come out, come out, we want to, you know, we want to arrest you, I don't know. Okay, you, you don't want a, a battering ram that hits and stops. You can do better. Put a rubber bumper at the end of the battering ram. So it hits, and then it bounces back off. It gives twice the transfer of momentum to the door, and you know, yes, you, you've won Publishers Clearinghouse. All right, whatever. Okay, uh, the one that okay. When I, I I got off on the story of you can't change your mass. So if you've got ten units of momentum to the right, and the fact that the momentum you carry is your mass times your velocity, since you can't change your momentum and you can't change your mass, you can't change your velocity either. It's stuck. This is why Newton's first law for translation motion ex exists. It's really secretly under the hood. What's really behind Newton's first law of motion? It's the conservation of momentum and the fact that you can't change your mass. 
So if you've got a certain amount of momentum, you have to keep moving at a constant velocity unless you exchange, okay? With rotational motion, life is a little more complicated. If you've got angular momentum, you can't change that, I mean, apart from exchanging with something. But you can change your rotational mass if you're not rigid. Remember, there's a rigid object clause in the Newton's first law for rotational motion. If you can change your uh, rotational mass, which you can do, you can muck around with the relationship between, well, you can change your angular velocity because you're, you're an object like any other object. Your angular momentum is the product of your rotational mass times your angular velocity. But now you can change your rotational mass. And when you do that, your angular velocity will change so the product of the two stays constant. Yes, your angular momentum will stay constant, but the individual components of it can vary. So that's the origin of the skater trick. So I'm going to start myself rotating. I'm going to get some angular momentum out of the ground while I have a big rotational mass. By putting my, the mass, far, most of the mass, far from the center, I've got a big rotational mass. You, you OK with that idea? Now, so now I've got angular momentum. If I shrink my rotational mass, my angular velocity has to increase. So the product of my rotational mass times my angular velocity never changes. It is my angular momentum. Is that okay? So this affects, you know, of course it, it affects skaters, but it affects so many other things. Any, any acrobatics done in the air, diver, an acrobat, gymnast, once you're in the air, your angular momentum is, is stuck, is fixed. Um, an issue that I will try to remember to come back to in two minutes. You know, you, you're not exchanging angular momentum with anything else, including gravity. That said then, you've got a fixed angular momentum, but that doesn't mean your angular velocity is, is, is stuck. You can change your angular velocity by changing your shape, and cha thereby changing your rotational mass. So if you watch divers off, say, a 10 meter platform, when they, when they dive, for, if they're not rotating and have no angular momentum when they leave the platform, they're stuck. They can't rotate it. They're, they're all the way to the water, they're, they're, they're hopeless. But they typically leave wide open like this, extended out with a big rotational mass, and they have some angular momentum. And then they pull into a tuck. And when they do that, they shrink their, angular, their rotational mass, and whatever angular momentum they have manifests itself as a bigger, as a faster rotational motion as a, their angular velocity goes up, just like when, you pull, when I pulled in my arms with the, with the dumbbells on it. So they spin faster. And then right before they hit the water, a diver I'm thinking of, right, uh, right before they hit the water, they want to look as though they just have, have stopped rotating altogether. They can't. They can't completely stop rotating because they can't get rid of their angular momentum. But they can at least spread out so that their rotational mass is so big that it's hard to notice they have angular momentum. So it's all a trick, tricks of timing and shape that allow them to go from seemingly not rotating to rotating fast to seemingly not rotating again. Is that okay? Um, so that's all I wanted to say about angular momentum. I did want then to talk about the third topic, which I, a third topic that shows up in bumper cars. I, in bumper cars, I put it in the context of what if the, if the floor isn't level? And there are, there are hills and valleys and stuff. And the idea is that, that we know that if, if there are ramps around, objects accelerate down ramps. Why? Because on a ramp, you, you, an object, like a, a wheeled object, something that doesn't experience a lot of friction, uh, it experiences a ramp force, a force downhill. It's, we, we, we talked about that at length. So it, that for, forces cause acceleration. So objects tend to accelerate down ramps. Is that okay so far? Well, what if the ramps are really complicated or there are forces around that, that, that don't even sort of fit into this category like electromagnetic forces or, or nuclear forces or you know, a whole bunch of different forces? Is there some way of figuring out which way something's going to accelerate? Ah. And the answer is yes. The fact is potential energies are energies stored in forces. So they're completely related to each other. Forces and potential energies are best buddies. If you can find the direction that will reduce an object's potential energy as quickly as possible, its total potential energy, 
So, so, so an object, pick an object anywhere, this ball here, okay? If it, you look at all the other places it could be in the vicinity of where it actually is, if you discover it can go in that direction and reduces total potential energy as quickly as possible, that's the direction it'll, it'll accelerate. And that's obvious here, here for this ball right here now, the only potential energy that matters is, is gravitational, and that direction actually is the direction that, that, that counts, the direction that reduces its total potential energy as quickly as possible, and that's the one it'll accelerate in. It won't necessarily move in that direction. I can give you an example where it's not. It's going up, right? But it will accelerate in that direction, okay? So a better example of that is, is this ball hanging from a string when it comes out here, it's not obvious which direction it's going to accelerate in. Uh, it's not, it's not going to go down because it's got another, another issue and it's got this string in this or, or metal, metal cable here. And there's energy stored in the cable too, it's stretched and so on. And which way is it going to accelerate? Well, it turns out it's going to accelerate in the direction that reduces its total potential energy as quickly as possible and that is that way. It's trying to get rid of Primarily, it's gravitational. It can't do that by going down, but it can do that by going towards the center of the swing. Is that okay? So for the bumper car idea, you can, you can look at, at the potential energy of the bumper car along that erratic landscape, and it will keep accelerating. We don't know which way it's moving. That depends on its history. But we know which way it's going to accelerate. All right? And that'll be useful. It's just a useful tool for us in situations like you tip a Tip a tricycle, which way does it accelerate? Oh, it's too messy. It's, you know, there are forces and torques and all sorts of things. Simple, it will accelerate in the direction that reduces its total potential energy as quickly as possible. All right, so that's where we'll start using that. Of course, the other thing to show you, because I can, and I could have you all do this, and I guess I'm, somebody, uh, somebody, wanna, somebody who believes in conservation of energy wanna come up here? Yeah, Alex, come on up here. Okay, so the idea is this. Energy is a conserved quantity, Assuming nothing does work on this system here, the energy it has is trapped. You get against the wall, okay, right? And you can pull this up to your forehead. And assuming, don't push it. If you push it, you do work on it, right? You add energy to the system. But right now, the, energy, the only energy the system has is gravitational. And if you believe in conservation of energy, it can't go any higher than it currently is. All right, you, you can do whatever you like. <laughs> Yay! If you look at the wall here, you will find, they, they mostly got rid of them, but uh, <laughs> there have been a few people that have pushed. Ah! <laughs> Thank you. Yay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, you know, along with this being fun and games, and really a demonstration that energy is conserved. It's also, you're watching energy go back and forth between two different forms. It's, it, it, when it's out here, the ball is not moving. At this point, poor Alex's head is smushed, but the ball, the ball is not moving, so it, it has no kinetic energy, but it has a lot of gravitational potential energy. It's high. As it swings, when it gets down to the lowest point, all of its energy is kinetic. So it's potential, kinetic, potential, kinetic, potential, kinetic. It's going back and forth. Right? And until it runs out of energy, of extra energy, it's going to keep swinging. All right. So that, um, let me let that bring us to, to talk a little bit about spring scales. Like, I'll get started in this. And the idea is this, that if you want to measure the weight of something, I mean, you can quantify flour in two seemingly similar ways, but they're different. One is, to take a kilogram of flour, you can figure it's a kilogram by exerting a one newton force on it and seeing if it accelerates at one meter per second squared. That, that actually defines a newton. Um, so you can figure out by shaking the bag how much mass it has. And that's a great way of quantifying flour. It's just hard to do, so we don't do it. Instead, we weigh the flour. We see how hard gravity pulls on it. And that's a little more iffy as far as quantifying flour, because if you go to the moon, the weights are all off, because the moon's gravity is different. But, okay, we live with this anyway. And the way we measure weight, traditionally or classically, is with a spring. 
So you take an object, this happens to be a one kilogram object. So this is exactly what I was describing. It's one, it's one kilogram of really dense flour. Okay. We could do this and go, oh yeah, it's a kilogram. Or we could set it on that scale and go, oh, it's about 10 newtons of weight. And they're, they're sort of equally good. So how in the world does the scale figure this out? It's telling us 10 newtons but, of weight, but what's it doing? Well, it can't go inside the object and figure out how hard gravity is pulling on it. But what it can do is try to make sure that object doesn't move, ah, it doesn't accelerate. And to do that, it has to perfectly support the object's weight. And that's what it's doing right now. It's perfectly supporting that one kilogram's object, object's weight. And then it's telling you how hard the scale is pushing on the object. That's what it's actually reporting. It's not literally reporting the object's weight. It's reporting how hard it's pushing up. And how does it do that? It does that by using a spring to support the object. And springs have this, this great characteristic that they push back on themselves, on their ends, with forces or torques, depending on the situation, that are proportional to how far you've moved them away from their favorite shape. So this spring has, right now, uh, is essentially free of for forces and torques. And I promised you guys something, and I didn't fulfill it. And I'm going to take a moment to do that. When a gymnast is in the air, or a diver is in the air, they're experiencing no torques. Remember I told you that? Their, their angular momentum is constant. Why, aren't, why doesn't gravity exert a torque on them? It does exert a force on them. The reason it doesn't exert a torque on them is because gravity acts at their set, effectively acts at their center of gravity. And, they, and their center of rotation is effectively their center of mass. Center of gravity, center of mass. They're being pulled right at their, those two points coincide in space. And so they're, you, the diver, are being pulled right at your center of mass. And there's no lever arm, there's no torque. Long and short of it is gravity doesn't exert torques on, on objects here near the surface of the Earth. Uh, so it doesn't cause any transfer of angular momentum to or from things. So when you're in the air, you're on your own. Your angular momentum is stuck. You don't have anything. The, the gravity doesn't do anything. OK? That was my, OK, I fulfilled my duty. Now I'm back here. So this is its equilibrium shape. And if I distort it pretty much any way I want to distort it, it will push back or twist back, trying to return to this equilibrium shape. And the, the, the torques or forces or twists it experiences will be proportional to how far I've taken it away from equilibrium. So if, for example, I, sh I smush it, if I smush it one centimeter, it pushes back with, I don't know, 10 newtons of force, let's say. If I smush it two centimeters, it pushes back twice as hard, 20 newtons. Three centimeters, 30 newtons, and so on. Beautiful proportionality. You can see it over here on this, this guy. Eh, I mean, just for time, I won't do that. Um, this is amazingly wide, uh, universal, this effect. It affects not just coil springs. I mean, you look at that and you say, you know, what is this? Of course, it's a spring, right? But it also applies to things like this. You know, what's this? Well, it's a stick, you know, a meter stick. Or you a long yardstick, an inaccurate yardstick, okay? But it's spring-like. It behaves just like a spring. If this is its equilibrium shape, and if I bend it away from equilibrium, one centimeter pushes back with, I don't know, five newtons of force. If I bend it two centimeters away from equilibrium, it pushes back with two times five newtons of force, th three centimeters, and so on. It, it's like just spring, too. And this behavior that springs pretty universally push back with what are called restoring forces, trying to restore the, th the spring to equilibrium, to its equilibrium shape. That those restoring forces are proportional to how far you've distorted it. That's known as Hooke's Law. And it's pretty universal. There are things that are not spring-like, we'll, and we'll deal with them. But most things are like springs. And so that relationship between distortion and force allows a spring scale to work. The spring scale isn't literally telling you how hard it's pushing on the thing above it. It's telling you how distorted it is. But since the distortion and how hard it's pushing are related and proportional, that's good enough. It's basically telling you how hard it's pushing up on the thing next to it, above it. 
Okay, so uh, have a good weekend and we'll see you on Monday.